So, equations of motion. No more graphs. Let's get down to some maths. I know some of you will be happy with that. First, let's review some basic facts. We have distance and we have displacement. The symbol for distance is a small d and for displacement it's s. Both are measured using meters and, just a reminder, distance is a scalar and displacement is a vector. And here we have a very simple illustration. Distance is the entire journey, which in this case would be 250 metres, and displacement is how far am I from where I once started? And that's a direct route, 128. Similarly, we have speed and velocity. Speed is with a small s, not to be confused with displacement, but to, to be honest, we never use them in the same context. Speed is a scalar with units of meters per second. And velocity, symbol V, is a vector. Let's have a look at the definition for, velo for velocity and speed. We use this expression, rate of change. Okay, so speed would be the rate of change with res of distance with respect to time, and velocity would be the rate of change of displacement. Similarly, a qu quick reminder of how to calculate it. For any instantaneous moment, you would work out the speed as distance over time, but if you're working out the velocity, it would be the displacement over time. But these equations are for very, very, very specific instances, and so we don't really use them very often. The one that we do use is average speed. And average speed would be a total distance over a total time. Anyway, this is all just revision, and you guys know all of this. So let's mo move on to something new. Okay, acceleration it's not something we've spent that much time on, so let's go over it carefully here. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity with respect to time. Acceleration, because it's a product of velocity, is also a vector. And how do we work out this instantaneous acceleration? The change in velocity over time. Now this relationship is a little bit more useful but we're going to come back to it in a minute. Now just before we go, we have another thing to think about. Acceleration is a change in velocity. Now you can change your velocity, but keep the same speed. So for example, if you are going at 10 meters per second, and then you suddenly move up in this direction to 10. In this case, you would also have an acceleration because you have changed your directional component of the velocity. This is in fact what happens when you are moving around in a circle. You move around at the same speed, but because your direction is continuously changing, then you have an acceleration. It's just something to consider at this stage, but we will cover this in a separate chapter. Now, these are your four main equations of motion. Before we start, let's remind ourselves of the symbols. V is velocity. U is also velocity, but it's the initial velocity. So now we're differentiating between the final velocity and the initial a is acceleration and T is time. So the first equation is final velocity equals initial velocity plus acceleration times time. Our second equation, S, refers to displacement. 
So the displacement equals the initial velocity times time plus a half times the acceleration times time squared. You have seen this before in our acceleration experiments. Equation number three, S, displacement, is equal to final velocity plus initial velocity divided by two times t. And the last equation, four, is final velocity squared equals initial velocity squared plus two times acceleration times displacement. Now these four equations are on the data booklet. That means you don't need to learn them off by heart. However, it is definitely in your interest to learn them so that they come to you naturally. You don't have to waste time looking for them. So I recommend that you start learning them today. Now, now the next thing we're going to look at is um, when should we apply these formulas? and where these equations come from, how to derive them. Equations of motion only apply when motion is in a straight line and there is a constant acceleration. Now, a good example of this is when you have free fall and air resistance is ignored. Only if air resistance is ignored. Try and think why that would be the case. If an object is falling in free fall and there is air resistance, then the acceleration is changing. And if the acceleration is changing, you cannot apply the equations of motion. Similarly, if an object goes up and then comes down, the acceleration changes. So you would not be able to use the equations of motion as a single in one single go. So let's derive v equals u plus at. For, to do this, we're going to visualize the motion of an object as a velocity time graph. Imagine that object starts at time equals zero at a velocity of u. That's its initial velocity. At the end of a 10 second time period, or we can call it t, that velocity has changed and gone to v. A general way to express the acceleration is using the idea that the gradient of the velocity time graph will give us the acceleration. So if we can find the gradient of this line, then we can work out the acceleration. The gradient, as you will remember, is the height of this change, which in this case would be equal to v minus u. That would be our y interval here, our change in the y-axis. Our change in the x-axis is equivalent to this time period t. So the acceleration is the change in velocity v minus u divided by time t. Now if we just rearrange this equation in its linear form, it gives us our first expression, v equals u plus at, and that's your first derivation. Similarly, using what we know about velocity time graphs, we can work out displacement. So we're going to derive this displacement formula, s equals ut plus half at squared. What do we know about velocity time graphs and displacement? Well, to calculate the displacement, we should work out the area under the graph. So considering the same object as before, one that goes from u meters per second to v meters per second over a time period t, we have a rectangle and a triangle. So let's work out using u, v, and t, the area of both of these sections. 
starting with the rectangle first, we have a height of u and a width for this triangle of length t. So the area A would be equal to ut. This triangle is a little bit more complicated. The width of this triangle again is t. The height, however, would be equal to v minus u. If we then work out the area of the triangle, we end up with half, because it's a triangle, v minus u, t. Add those two together, we have a total displacement of half v minus u t plus u t. Now that's not very tidy, so let's find a way of making it look a bit neater. Let's come down here where it's explained. v minus u, as you can see there, is also equal to a t. Where did we get this from? Okay, rewind to yes, um, the last formula we did just a few minutes ago. V equals U plus AT. That means V minus U equals AT. Yeah, remember? So now you put this AT in there instead. And you end, you're, you're ending up with half AT. times t plus ut. Multiply these two t's together and we end up with s equals ut plus half a t squared. And that's your second formula. To derive our third formula, we're just going to have a little bit of a thinking exercise. We know that average velocity equals displacement over time. And what do we mean by average velocity? If we go back to that graph we had a minute ago, we have an initial velocity of u and a final velocity of v. What's our average? Our average is going to be in the centre there. How do we work that out? Well, the best way to work it out simply is to just add u plus v divided by 2 and that would give you your average. This is a really quick way of deriving this next formula. If u plus v over t equals the rate of change of displacement s over t then rearranging we can find s equals u plus v over 2 t. And our last equation is just a bit of a mix and match. And you can do this with any of the equations. But your fourth one is simply, is simply substituting one into the other. So if we take equation one, which did look like this, v equals u plus at. And you rearrange it to give you t equals v minus u over a. And you substitute that into the last equation I gave you, t equals 2s over u plus v. Hang on a minute, what did it look like before? It looked like this. Okay, so you equate it to make t the subject of the equation. And what you end up with is the same subject, which means that these two are also equal. So if we expand that, v minus u over a equals 2s over u plus v. What we now need to do is to expand or multiply out these brackets here. So if we rearrange that, we get 2s a 
multiplying these two, equals v minus u times u plus v. If we multiply out the brackets then, you end up with 2sa equals v squared plus, oops, actually it's a minus, minus u squared. Just bring that last term over here, u squared plus 2sa equals v squared. And that's your last formula. Now it's not incredibly important that you know these off by heart, but the idea of deriving is an important one. You could, in an exam, be asked to derive them step by step with a little bit of guidance. So make sure that you've understood each of the steps. So now you've got your four equations of motion, what are you going to do with them? Well, there are some rules that you need to follow, otherwise it becomes very complicated. It's really important that for any problem that you have, you always draw a sketch to try and visualise it. It's important that you consider separately when the acceleration changes, okay? And thirdly, always write down the information from the problems before you start doing any calculating. If you compile a little column called SUVAT at the start of the problem, S for displacement, U for initial velocity, V for vinyl velocity, A for acceleration, T for time. And as you read the question, you can add it to this column. Let's try this example. A ball is thrown upwards at a velocity of 25 meters per second from a cliff top and falls into the sea 6.1 seconds later. Calculate the height of the cliff above the sea level, assuming air resistance being negligible. Now the fact that air resistance is negligible means that acceleration is constant. We haven't finished with acceleration yet. The next thing you have to do is choose which direction is positive. If upwards is considered a positive, then all quantities that go up are labelled positive. All quantities that go down are then labelled negative. That means that if your acceleration is considered positive at the beginning, the velocity in that direction will also be positive. And anything coming down would then be considered a minus value. If you're ready, you can write all your values down. Remembering, of course, your sign convention. In this case, plus is positive. So let's have a look at our values. Our displacement is unknown. We do not know what the total displacement is. We know when it reaches the water, its total will be equal to the height of the cliff. But that's all we know. Our initial velocity is 25 meters per second. But we don't know our final, because by the time it goes up to the top and then comes down again, its final velocity would have changed. The acceleration is minus 9.81, because we've considered velocity up to be 25 plus, so now acceleration is minus. And the time for the journey is 6.1 seconds. The next bit is to choose the correct equation. Now the best equation to choose is one where you have most, if not all, of the values except for one. So if we use this one, we can find the displacement here. We know the initial velocity is, it's 25. We know time is 6.1. We know the acceleration is minus 9.81 and the time is 6.1 seconds. Substitute those values in, 
and we can get a height of the cliff, remembering that we're starting here and the displacement is from there to the bottom, of 29.8 metres. Okay, so remember those three steps. Firstly, draw a sketch. Secondly, decide on a positive direction. And number three, don't forget SUVAT. Write a column and fill out, fill out those variables. Displacement, initial velocity, final velocity, acceleration and time. Okay, so now you can practice some questions.